requirements for common spaces, um, accessible routes, and uh, dwelling and sleeping units. First, we'll start at looking how the accessibility chapter 11 in the building code is organized. Um, there are two main components to the chapter, the scope and the design. Uh, we'll focus on uh, those sections that are highlighted here on the slide, and we will um, focus mostly on the design, but not the scope today, so the design of the spaces, um, accessible, in, accessible route, common spaces, and accessible dwelling units. Also in chapter 11, uh, the reference standard that's used throughout and is very critical is the ICC, or also known as ANSI A117.1. So buildings and facilities shall be designed and constructed to be accessible in accordance with this standard. Um, a question, if, if we were live in a room, I would be asking and expecting a response, but this is a, also a very critical piece of information. Does everyone know what edition of the ICC A117.1 is currently used, referenced in the building code? Hopefully you had a chance to, res to respond um, and now I'll reveal the answer and it's 2009 of the ICC A117.1. Next, we're looking at the organization. Uh, it's a similar slide to the building code organization chapter. Now it's the ICC A117.1 of 2009. Um, so this is how it's uh, organized. And today we'll look at many of these sections, um, but we'll start out looking at the building blocks, chapter three of the standard, because this chapter has bits and pieces of information that are referenced throughout the, um, and used throughout the standard and the building code as well. Um, actually, just to go over this in a little more detail, the, Building blocks are consist of floor surfaces, changes in level, turning spaces, clear floor spaces, knee and toe clearances, protruding ob objects, and uh, reach ranges and, up to, and operable parts. So again, we're starting with the building blocks. And the first building block uh, we're gonna go over is um, covered in ICC A117.1, section 303.2, vertical changes. This is common um, when the floor surfaces um, are changed, for instance, from a kitchen to a wood flooring or from a bathroom or a threshold. Um, a wheelchair or a person in a wheelchair would only be able to maneuver over a threshold that's maximum of a half inch height. And even that is cannot be a straight edge. There are three options that you have. If the threshold or change in, in level is up to quarter inch, it can have a straight edge, as you could see on the left top image. Um, so quarter inch straight edge is fine. If the change in level is up to a half inch, anything between a quarter inch and a half inch would have to be beveled. Or another option, you see the one, the last one on the right, you can bevel the whole height, the whole half inch can be beveled. Uh, one to two in order for a wheelchair to be able to maneuver the space. Um, next building block of the accessibility is the turning space, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. Um, so it's a 60 inch minimum diameter for a wheelchair turning space, and it's covered in section 3043A. Um, it's uh, important to note that doors can swing into the turning space and also we'll go over toe and knee clearances later, but uh, toe and knee clearances shall be permitted in the space as well. And um, 
there is another option for the turning space. It's a T-shaped oh, turning space, which is covered in ICCA 117.1304.3b. And you can see the dimensions in, in this diagram on the right. Next building block of accessibility is the clear floor space. Clear floor space is required in many um, spaces to approach appliances and fixtures. The basic um, dimension of a clear floor space is, as you can see on the left, it's 30 inches by 48 inches, uh, sort of the size of the wheelchair. Then um, whenever a person in a wheelchair needs to position themselves in front of an object, um, there are two options, so a forward approach and a parallel approach. So the 30 by 48 inches will have to be able to face an object or be parallel to it. Uh, and the last um, part of this is whenever there is um, an alcove and the clear floor space is required, the clear floor space would have to be greater. As you can see here, the depth of an alcove is 24, greater than 24 inches. The 30 inch minimum changes to 36 inches. And for a parallel approach, if the depth of an alcove is greater than 15 inches, the depth, the width of the clear floor space will have to be 60 inches instead of 48 inches minimum. Next building block of accessibility is tow and knee clearances. Um, what's good about this is that the tow, whenever you provide a tow and knee clearance in front of an object like a work, work surface or a lavatory or a sink, um, you're, you're allowed to overlap the clear floor space so the toes and knees can go under the, the piece of equipment or system. And here you could see the tow clearances are covered in ICCA 117.1, section 306.2. And you see how much they can extend under six, uh, up to six inches maximum. And the height is nine inches. And the knee clearance is covered in ICCA 117.1, section 306.3. Here you, you could see some better images of what this looks like. Important dimension to note is the 25 inches maximum. You can see the person would not be able to reach beyond the 25 inches. Um, it would be an obstructed breach. Um, so if there's a counter overhang, 25 inches is the maximum overall with knees and toes included. And the minimum is also given it's 17 inches minimum. So the person can actually reach if there are controls on the back wall or, or something a switch they need to reach it to. Um, 17 inches is the minimum dimension for that. So now we have a couple of questions that are very commonly asked um, and I would like to uh, share uh, the responses with you. First question is, um, is turning space required in all the rooms and spaces? So if, if you can take a second and think about it and uh, maybe give us some responses in the Q&A um, chat box, and I'll give you an answer just in a second. Sorry, one second, hold on. Okay, sorry for that inter interruption, but here's the answer. So, um, is the turning space required in all the room and spaces? And the answer is no. Turning spaces are only required in those rooms that are specifically called out in the building code or, or, the, sta or the standard. Um, such spaces include um, dressing and fitting rooms, bathing facilities, toilets, and lodging guests, guest rooms. 
So unless specifically called out for a turning space, in the standard, uh, all other spaces are not required to have a turning space. Next question. Can a clear floor ground space or turning space overlap other space requirements? So you could see the diagram here on the right. And the question is for either the turning space um, or the clear ground space, which we covered earlier in the building blocks, can those overlap um, other space requirements? And the answer is yes. Clear floor and ground space and turning space can overlap other require, required clearances, including other clear floor spaces, door maneuvering clearances, and fixture clearances. But there's, of course, a note. Uh, door, doors, like you see here in the bathroom, shall not swing into the clear floor space or clear clearance for any fixture. And this applies to common bathrooms, um, not the bathrooms in the dwelling units themselves. Uh, next building block, um, we're going to talk about protruding objects. So whenever you have a, a circulation path, protruding ob objects are um, really not permitted in that space. And the only allowance for it is anything beyond above 27 inches above the floor um, can uh, extend four inches out and that's the only protrusion that's permitted anything that's below 27 inches um, and extending out would need to have um, a barrier placed, like you see here under the stair there's a barrier or it would have to be placed in an alcove because a person with a cane um, would be able to detect it in time and not bump into um, anything that's coming up ahead of them, like you see in this image. And also anything beyond um, above 80 inches can ex extend as much as uh, necessary because that's overhead and not considered an, obstru an obstruction. So there, there's no issue with that. Next building block, we're gonna talk about bridge ranges. This is covered in um, ICC A117.1 section 308.2. First, um, we're going to talk about the forward, forward bridge. And you can see here a person um, in a wheelchair would be able to reach um, face, facing an object uh, without an obstruction, which unobstructed um, anything of 15 inches above finished floor and up to 48 inches above finished floor. As soon as there is something present in, in the way, that's up to 20 inches. Uh, you still have the maximum height requirement of 48 inches. And, and if there's anything between 20 inches and 25 inches extending out, um, that becomes an obstructed uh, reach range. And the maximum height for anything beyond that uh, object would be less than 48 inches and it would become a 44 inch maximum height because of the obstruction. <laughs> um, the, other, the other component to this is the side ridge. And you could see in the first image, the side ridge is, is the same uh, for forward and side ridge. It's anything between 15 inches minimum and 48 inches maximum and it's considered unobstructed. Um, and of course, there's the obstructed version of it, which minimizes the maximum height to 46 inches when you have an obstruction uh, between 10 and 24 inches. So this will be very useful. Uh, we'll look at this. Uh, and use this building block later on, uh, for example, in when we're, we're going to be looking at mail, mail rooms and mailboxes, and how those are required to be arranged. So first we'll start with accessible route. Um, accessible route is required 
in um, the residential buildings to provide accessible routes to all the units and all the common spaces that are used within the building or outdoors. Um, so here is the actual code section that requires this. It's building code section 1107.4. At least one accessible route shall connect accessible building or facility entrances with the required accessible entrances of each accessible unit type B plus NYC unit type B unit within the building or facility and with those exterior interior spaces and facilities that serve the unit. So uh, here you, you see some examples of components of an accessible route in the pictures below. And now that we know that the accessible route must be provided, we'll look down more closely and uh, break down each component of the accessible route. Um, here are some highlights first to start out with. Um, in ICCA 117.1 section 403, it covers walking surfaces. Some highlights for that is uh, the slope of a walking surface. It's uh, not greater than 1 to 20. And the clear width, mostly 36 inches is required. There are some uh, exceptions to it, and we'll look at this later on. Um, the next component is going to be doors and doorways. It's uh, in section 404 of the ICCA 117.1. Um, an important point about that is that the minimum clear door opening should be 32 inches. But there are also some modifications to that, and we'll look at this later on. Next um, component is the ramps. Um, and the slope for ramps, how do you know the difference between walking surface versus a ramp? The slope becomes for ramp becomes anywhere between 1 to 20 and not steeper than 1 to 12. Uh, another component is elevators, and we'll look at that. It's covered in section 407 of the ICC A117.1, and we'll look more closely at the car sizes for elevators. And the last but not least, uh, compo the component of accessible route is platform lifts, but um, you will see that the building code mostly does not permit um, platform lifts in common spaces of residential buildings. Um, here you see an example of a first floor plan and an accessible route. Um, so from the front entrance, connecting all types of uh, common spaces, mailboxes, storage room, bicycle room, uh, bathroom, uh, elevators, leading to the elevators um, to go upstairs. Um, so this would be some, some example, an example. And here's an example of a typical floor plan. So on a residential floor, a corridor would, would be a, an accessible route to all the apartments or dwelling units. So first we'll look at the clear width. The clear width is covered in section um, 403 and 403.5 of the ICC M117.1 um, talks about these uh, diagrams. So the minimum clear width is 36 inches. However, you're allowed um, to reduce that to 32 inches, but only for up to maximum of 24 inches, as you could see in the top uh, image here. And if you have more of these reductions, they would have to be spaced apart by 48 inches. So the maximum dimension for the reduced width is 24 inches, but the rest must be 36 inches minimum clear width. Now we'll look at um, clear width when, whenever there is a 180 degree turn. And you could see the image on the left. Uh, if you're making a turn uh, in the The minimum width would have to be approaching the turn would have to be 42 inches during the turn and would have to be 48 inches minimum. 
and also leaving the turn, it would again have to be 42 inches um, minimum there with um, leaving the turn. And this is whenever there's an obstruction or an object present that's less than 48 inches here in the center. And of course, there's an exception to this, and the exception is uh, that if you have 60 inches minimum at the turn, then you can provide the regular 36 inches uh, there with approaching the turn, because you, you have more uh, maneuvering space to get around the corner. Uh, next part of accessible route is um, clear is the this is a, actually a, a typo here but the next component is uh, the turning space so whenever you have a 36 inches minimum uh, clear width you would have to provide a, a passing space of 60 by 60 inches minimum for two wheelchairs to negotiate the space. So unless you have 60 inches there with throughout, um, this passing space would have to be provided. So one option would be like, um, if you recall the building blocks, it's a 60 inch diameter turning space, or here it's a 60 by 60 space, so two wheelchairs can um, negotiate the space. The other option would be to have a T space, T turning space, also like the component, one of the building blocks we looked at. Next component we're gonna look at is the doors. Um, so doors are part of an accessible route because obviously you, you, whenever you're using a building, you're passing through multiple doors and all the doors on an accessible route must comply with the ICCA 117.1, section 404. Um, one of the main requirements from that section is the 32 inches minimum clear width for all the doors. Uh, how do we measure clear width? Um, so for a regular swing, swinging doors, the measurement would have to be taken from the face of the door when it's open 90 degrees to the stop. Um, and that dimension clear width would have to be 32 inches. And then you see some other sliding doors and folding doors. There are other options for that. And also, if there's an opening without a doorway and the opening is greater than 24 inches in depth, um, the clear width for such opening would have to be 36 inches, not 32 inches, because it's a bigger, deeper space to get through. So it needs a little more uh, space to accommodate a person in a wheelchair. Um, another another part to this is the two doors in the series. This is very common in uh, apartment buildings, uh, vestibules, entrance vestibules, uh, to prevent infiltration of air from the outside. Sometimes there are two sets of doors that are provided. In this example, in this floor plan, you see this. There's a vestibule uh, separating a library and a corridor. And you see the two doors in the series um, are in, on the way, on the common path. So two doors in the series are covered in ICC A117.1 section 404.2.5, but it's also covered in the building code and it's not in the accessibility chapter, it's in the, uh, means of egress chapter, chapter 10, section 1008.1.8. Um, 
so if we compare the two requirements, you will see that they're pretty much very similar. It, it says that distance between two hinged doors or pivoted doors in series shall be 48 inches minimum plus the width of the door swinging into the space and the space or the space between the doors shall be um, shall also provide turning space. Um, you will notice that in the building code it says doors in series shall swing either in the same direction or away from each other. So it's kind of not allowing for this middle configuration. But then if you read the exception, there's exception five, which permits this arrangement as well in residential buildings. Next, we'll, uh, if you recall, we'll just uh, go back to the building blocks for a second and um, thresholds are always present at doors. So the change in level has to be um, really paid attention to. And the maximum change in level that's uh, for the straight edge could be up to a quarter inch. And if, if the change in level is greater than that and up to a half inch, it would have to be beveled, like shown in other images. And also New York City Building Code covers this in uh, section 1008.1.7. And the accessibility, um, in terms of accessibility chapter, the reference is um, ICC 117.1, section 303. Next component of an accessible route is um, we're going to go over is the ramps. Uh, ramps are uh, part of an accessible route and should have a slope anywhere between. 1 to 20 and no steeper than 1 to 12 inches. So here you have uh, details on the ramps. Um, it's important to see that uh, Ramps are covered in the building code as well as in ICC 117.1. Um, handrails must be provided as well as guards in certain situations. So the handrails um, extension must be one foot minimum at the top and bottom of the ramp. Also, a landing has to be provided uh, at the top and bottom of the ramp. The maximum run for a ramp is 30 feet. If the ramp needs to be greater than that, a landing would have to be provided um, in the middle of it to reduce the run of the ramp. Uh, again, it's maximum 30 feet. So the ramp um, landing has to be a minimum of five feet. Um, handrails must be provided anywhere where the rise is greater than six inches and uh, guards must be also provided if the rise is greater than 30 inches in height. So the guards are required by the building code but there is an edge protection requirement that's in the ICC A117.1. Um, the edge protection is intended for um, a person in a wheelchair or a person with a cane or anybody else not to step over and suddenly um, fall through or um, something to get through the edge of the ramp. So there are four options for um, edge protection. First is the platform with extended edge, like you see in the first image, it, it must be 12 inches minimum, um, extending outwards. 
Next one is ramp with a curb. So you can provide a curb with four inches minimum uh, height. Uh, also, th there could be ramps with the side walls or ramps with the railing and the barrier. But remember, the clear width has to be preserved at 36 inches minimum between the rails. Next component of an accessible route um, is elevators and platform lifts. So all passenger elevators on an accessible route shall be accessible and comply with section 301.3. Um, this is a requirement in the building code, um, section 1109.6. Um, and also, um, if you go to chapter 30, which is the elevator chapter, um, this will require you to comply with the ICCA 117.1 and um, passenger elevators, including destination oriented elevators required to be accessible by chapter 11. So here you see the dimensions of the elevator cars, the minimum dimensions. Um, the first one is the center door location and uh, that one has a minimum dimension of 51 inches interior inside to, to 80 inches. Second one is a side door door the, located on the side. Next one is the any configuration. And then um, the last image is um, for existing buildings, which we're not gonna get into today, but an existing car configuration can be of a little bit of a smaller dimension than the new construction. Um, if, if you're familiar with the, the new requirements in the 2014 code, um, the stretcher, elevator to accommodate the stretcher is required. There is a building bulletin on this. It's a building bulletin 8 of 2017, and it gives you these um, diagrams on the size of the elevator dimensions required for elevators that have to accommodate an ambulance stretcher. And the elevators for this purpose are larger than the accessibility elevators we looked at um, before. So it's important to be aware of this and to remember to provide an elevator that can accommodate an ambulance stretcher if required. And uh, not to worry that if, if this elevator is provided, for the requirement, it's larger than the accessibility requirements, so it will still comply with the ICC um, standard. And here you see a typical floor plan that has um, an elevator on the left to accommodate a stretcher, and it has to comply with sections of the building code 3002.4.2, and then you see passenger elevators, the rest of them, the three elevators on the left, and they would have to comply um, with the ICC A117.1 section 407.4.1. Um, so this slide shows you um, some sections and details on signals and controls for elevators on the outside and the interior of the elevator. Um, so the, if you need to know um, the sections here would uh, explain the location for such controls and signals that would have to be provided for an elevator, the, push, the call buttons and the push buttons on, on the interior. 
and they're covered in uh, Chapter 4 of ICC 117.1 standard. Uh, as promised, we'll, we're going to look briefly at the platform lift. And uh, as I mentioned before, they're mostly not permitted. And the only location that is allowed for building code for a platform lift is within the dwelling unit. So here is a quick slide on summarizing platform lifts. But again, this would only be in the dwelling unit. And uh, chair lifts are not allowed. Um, and only, they can only be used in addition to accessible means of egress. Also, for existing buildings, uh, even though we're not going into this today, but there is a building bulletin 08 of 2016 that talks about the platform lifts um, for prior code buildings. Now we're going to get into accessible common spaces. So accessible common spaces um, in a building are covered in building code section 1107.3, and it says that rooms and spaces available to the general public are available for common use by residents of accessible units, type B units, and type B plus and YC units um, must be accessible. Examples um, of accessible rooms are or spaces include uh, mail rooms or mailboxes, uh, refuse rooms and recyclable storage, laundry rooms, terraces, um, rooftops, community rooms, bathrooms, parking, bicycle storage, fitness rooms, swimming pools, and other common use spaces. Well, maybe swimming pools is not that common, but it's still possible to have it in the common space of a residential building. So we'll start out with the uh, mail rooms and uh, mailboxes. Uh, mailboxes are covered in building code section 1107.3.1. And um, this section states 100% of mailboxes must comply with the ICC 117.1. Um, and all mailboxes cannot be higher than 48 inches above the finished floor. And for those of you who that are familiar with the USPS standard 4C, um, which is also a requirement um, by, by the postal office that the mailboxes must comply with in order for them to be considered um, legal and usable. Um, this requirement um, is less stringent, so 48 inches ma maximum height for all the ma mailboxes um, is a requirement of the building code and must be adhered to. And here you see uh, the reason for this is the reach ranges. So anything anything that needs to be reached or reached or operable parts has to be 15 inches minimum above the finished floor and 48 inches maximum in height. And this is again the building blocks. Uh, um, of the ICC standard. Next common space we're going to look at is a uh, refuse room uh, and recyclable storage. There is a building bulletin on this. It's um, building bulletin one of 2019, and it's the standard design um, is the first one that's covered in this bulletin. And the standard design includes a turning space inside the room, as well as a clear floor space inside the room. And the recycling bins uh, placement space also is inside the room and the refuse, refuse chute. But this is for um, standard design. There is an alternative design, um, which allows a push button to operate the door. And if that's um, provided, then the turning space and the clear floor space 
is not required. Note that the door, the minimum clear opening for the door is 36 inches. Um, for, for this alternative design. There is a floor plan example. Um, and my question would be, there are a few things that are wrong with this image, but my question would be, maybe you can, um, what comes to mind when you see this and what's missing in this floor plan? Uh, please feel free to respond in the Q&A um, chat box or uh, just think, think it through and let, let us know um, and hopefully you see what the mistake is. And the answer is uh, that a minimum five feet of floor area within each refuge should um, is not provided. And it, it's required per building code section 1213.3. And it's required for the temporary holding of the recyclables. Next common space um, we're going to go over is the laundry room. And um, this is covered in ICCA 117.1, section 611. Um, so Common question that that's often that often comes up: How many washers and dryers are required um, to be accessible? And the answer is um, provided in building code. It starts out in building code section 1107.2.8, uh, which talks about laundry room equipment, and it references section um, appendix E. 105.2, and when we go to that section, um, one of E105.2.1 washing machines, um, it states that if there are three or less washing machines that are provided, at least one must comply with the ICC standard uh, and section 611. And washing machines must be front loading if they're greater than three machines that are provided, at least two must comply with the ICC section 611. And also they must be front loading, which is a building code requirement. And the same goes for the closed dryers. If they're less than three, at least one must comply with section 611. And if they're greater than three, um, at least two, and they all must be front loading. Um, so a clear floor space, a building block, like we talked about, must be provided in front of the machines, and it has to be offset by 24 inches maximum um, if, for, in order to open the door and operate the machine. Um, and here you see that the top loading is not permitted. Uh, that's for building code. Not, neither washer or dryer are permitted to be top loading. And then you see like a quick diagram floor plan of a laundry room, which is would probably be in a very small building, but nevertheless, um, that's the, the floor plan. Next, we're gonna talk about um, accessible common spaces, um, uh, terraces and rooftops. And the uh, common mistake for this is a lot of times there's a transition to a terrace and there's a change in level. And if the change in level is greater than half an inch, um, a ramp or a curb ramp would have to be provided because it's beyond that uh, building block that you remember that's allowed um, half an inch of change in level. So if you do have only half an inch or less, then it's a regular threshold and um, you can comply with the change in level sections of the ICCA 117.1, um, section 303.2 or 303.3. Uh, again, this is the building blocks 
where the building blocks come into play. And because there's no change in level between the two elevations outside and inside of the space. Next um, space we're going to talk about is community room, and it's common to have a kitchen or kitchenette in the community room um, for the residents um, to use. So important to note that a, a clear floor space um, must be provided with knee and toe clearances compliant with 306, the building blocks like we talked about before. And uh, this is a clear floor space for this sink um, to approach the sink. However, there is an exception and a parallel approach is um, permitted complying with section 305. Um, centered on the sink, and it's only permitted where rooftops or conventional ranches are not provided. I'm sorry, skip the slide. Um, another part that's in the kitchens and kitchenettes is a work surface. Um, at least one work surface shall be provided in accordance with section 90 two of the ICC, A117.1, and there is an exception again, um, spaces that do not provide cooktop or conventional range shall not be required to provide an accessible work surface. Next space we're gonna talk about is the uh, toilet rooms or bathrooms um, in commons, common bathrooms um, accessible, available to all the residents of the building. Um, here you see a typical um, first floor example and the bathroom layout. Um, so there are a few requirements that are important to note for inside the bathrooms. Uh, first and foremost is the turning space. And this is only true for the common bathroom, not the residential uh, unit bathroom. A 60 inch turning circle or a T turn space is required within the bathroom or toilet room available to the residents. Door swing, doors shall not swing into the clear floor space or clearance of any fixture. Again, there's an exception and the exception states that um, if a clear floor space is provided beyond the swing of the door, then um, the doors, the, the section 603.2.2 regarding the door swing uh, can be disregarded and does not apply to those bathrooms. So the door would be able to swing into the clearances of other fixtures. And uh, also door maneuvering clearances must be provided on both sides of the door inside the bathroom and outside, and door maneuvering clearances are covered in section 404. Um, again, it's one of the uh, common um, requirements that must be, you, everyone must be aware of. The, uh, the maneuvering clearances must be provided on both sides of the door. Um, um, now we'll look at the fixtures in the bathroom, the water closet itself. Um, there is a, a clearance that's required at the water closet, it's 60 inches by 56 inches. And um, no other fixture can be within that space. So a lavatory that's in the bathroom cannot extend into this clear space for the maneuvering clearance for the water closet. The only items that are allowed to extend into the space are grab bars, as you see in the diagram, and the toilet paper dis dispenser. Next, we'll look at the grab bars. Grab bars are um, 
required to be installed in the common space bathrooms. Um, and the dimensions for the grab bars are covered in section 604.5. To be more exact, um, the location and dimensions are in 604.5. Uh, but the grab bar configuration themselves are covered in section 609 of the ICC A117.4 standard. And here you could see the diagrams, the side grab bar and the back grab bar, and the, the dimensions for it and the locations of, of the grab bars. And again, they're required to be installed um, from the start at the common bathrooms. Next is the lavatory um, in the bathroom. And lavatory is required to have a clear floor space approach to, to it. And you see, the again, the building block comes into play, uh, 30 inch by 48 inch for um, the sink approach for the lavatory approach. And as you recall, the tow and knee clearance um, is uh, required here as well. And it will permit the wheelchair to and the person to reach the controls, the faucet in the back of the sink. Now we'll talk about the parking um, and parking. The scope for the parking in R2 and R3 buildings is covered in building code section 1106 for the number of accessible parking stalls and band spaces. But we're not gonna get into a scope today too much. We, again, are focusing on the design and technical requirements of the um, accessibility chapter and accessibility standard. So the design is covered in ICC 117.1, section 502. And uh, section 502.2 talks about vehicle spaces and um, car parking spaces as well as manned parking spaces. The minimum width of a car parking space is 96 inches. The minimum width of a van parking space is 132 inches. Um, there is an exception and uh, for the van space. The minimum width can be reduced to 96 inches instead of 132 inches, and this is uh, only if a 96-inch accessible aisle is provided, access aisle is provided on the side of uh, the van parking spot. Otherwise, um, if a regular access aisle is provided, which is 60 inches, then um, the van parking spot must be 132. In inches in width. So a common question that um, we'll often get, if only one space is required for parking, must the van space be provided? So I'll give you a second to uh, answer this to yourselves or to us in the Q&A chat box. And hopefully you have an answer and let's see the correct answer. Yes. Um, and refer to, the, so yes, uh, a van space must be provided. So if there's only one parking spot in a building, um, that spot will have to be a van parking spot. This is covered in building code section 1106.5, which states for every six or fraction of a sixth of accessible parking spaces, at least one space shall be van accessible parking space. So the answer is right in the building. Uh, another common question that we get, can two parking spaces share a common access? And the answer is yes, two parking spaces are permitted to share uh, a common access aisle and uh, you can read more about the access aisle that's covered in section 502.4.2 of the ICC 117.1 standard. The minimum access aisle um, width is 60 inches as well. And 
last but not least, we'll talk about um, recreational facilities. Um, that includes fitness rooms, swimming pools, and bicycle storage. So at least one of each type of recreational facility must be connected by an accessible route. So people, everyone has access to the recreational facilities. And New York City um, building code has specific requirements for swimming pools covered in section 11. 09, it says to ref it references uh, ICCA 117.1, section 1109.1.1. Um, so if a swimming pool is provided, at least two accessible means of entry shall be provided into the swimming pool. And at least one accessible means of entry provided to a swimming pool must comply with section 1109.2. It must be a lift or it must be compliant with section 1109.3 and uh, has to be a sloped entry. So a lot of times uh, you see those uh, lifts in the swimming pools and that's the reason why, because uh, it, it takes up less room and, and it must be provided, at least two accessible means of entry shall be provided into the pool. So this is the last one of our common spaces. And now, um, going to move on to dwelling units and we can maybe answer a few more questions before we move on. There was a question um, we received, thank you Robert, uh, and it states uh, or asks, must all elevators comply with accessibility? And if you recall, um, all residential elevators must be accessible. So all elevators in the building, residential building that are used by residents must be accessible. Yes. And, and if required um, and for an elevator that accommodates an ambulance stretcher, that elevator must be provided as well. And that one would be larger than an accessible elevator. So you still comply with the accessibility requirements. Um, I guess there are no other questions, but you still have time to ask questions. So feel free to type in your questions uh, while Robert is presenting and I will do my best to answer them. Or I'll pass it along to Robert and he will answer them for, them, for, you, for you. Morning, everyone. Uh, just want to uh, again thank everyone for participating in today's presentation. Uh, I think we can all agree this is an important topic. Uh, seeing some of the questions that have come up, I just want to remind everyone that the the course presentation and related materials will be made available on the department website uh, subsequently, uh, so you will be able to access this information. Um, the other point I would like to make is that um, I think that it's really important to understand the nature of these requirements. Uh, we don't necessarily expect everyone to memorize them, though, right? So uh, you need to focus on them as sort of understanding the way that the requirements are structured and triggered. Um, so now we'll go into some of the requirements for the specific types of dwelling units. So in this portion, uh, I'll discuss some of the scoping requirements uh, and the applicability of the accessibility requirements. Uh, I'll touch on the types of accessible units for R1, R2, and R3 occupancy groups. And then we'll focus on some of the technical requirements, uh, touch on the resources and references, uh, some of the standards overlaps, uh, also the HPD guidelines. And then we'll take a look at some example drawings uh, for kitchens, bathing and toilet rooms, in-unit laundry, balconies, and then Try to address some of the questions um, as they come up. So first, 
Um, I think, as Maria pointed out, this is a, a presentation uh, talking about accessibility in residential buildings, and it can get quite complicated when you're talking about existing buildings. Um, 28.101.4.3 of the Administrative Code establishes the, the allowance for alterations in compliance with the 1968 Code. However, there is an exception, uh, exception number five for accessibility. And then in Building Code Chapter 11, there are specific provisions uh, for alterations to prior code buildings. Um, and it can get quite complicated because it's actually based on the value of the alterations, um, which is why we're not going to talk about it, right? It's a, it's a very important topic. And understandably, a lot of you uh, here for this presentation are probably interested in those requirements. Uh, it's just outside the scope of today's topic. So first, we'll look at what needs to be accessible and where. Um, so in 11071, you see here, um, dwelling or sleeping units shall be provided with accessible features in accordance with this section. And I do want to point out that there is a definition in 1102 intended to be occupied as a residence. Um, as it says, this refers to a dwelling unit or sleeping unit that can or will be used all or part of the time as the occupant's place of abode. There are additional um, qualifications uh, for, for example, um, the New York State Multiple Dwelling Law has Class A and Class B. Uh, then in BC Chapter 11, accessible units, Type B plus NYC and Type B units. So it's important to maintain um, clear distinctions between what we're talking about, Class B, Type B. Um, and then also should point out that New York City's interpretation of residence actually differs slightly from that contained in the IBC. Uh, so if you work in a lot of jurisdictions, you might come across this. Um, in New York City, the interpretation of residence is typically uh, based on the length of stay. Um, for example, uh, a month tends to be the, the important distinction there. Uh, whereas in the IBC world, um, it's really about the expectation that the occupant can return to the space. So there is a slight difference, which you may encounter depending on where you're so now we'll take a look at some of the scoping requirements. So first, um, a dwelling unit uh, for the purpose of Chapter 11, a single unit providing complete independent living facilities for one or more persons, including permanent provisions for living, sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation. So again, that is for a dwelling unit. By comparison, a sleeping unit is a room or space in which people sleep, which can also include permanent provisions for living, eating, and either sanitation or kitchen facilities, but not both. So that, that's an important distinction um, when you're looking at residential buildings to understand whether you're looking at a sleeping unit or a dwelling unit. So as I alluded to, there are kind of three levels of accessible units. The first are accessible units, and those comply with the code and the provisions for accessible units in ICC A117.1. Now, uh, the, the one we see a lot of in New York City, of course, is the type B plus NYC units, and those are in accordance with the code. Section 1004, type B units of ICC A117.1, with the modifications in 1107.21 through 0.2.8, and of course, uh, Appendix P code as well. The last and kind of the, the least stringent of these accessible units are Type B units, um, which obviously have uh, the requirements in the code, um, and Type B units in ICC A117.1. And those are consistent with the requirements in the Federal Fair Housing Act. Now, looking at those three types of units um, and our three types of residential occupancies. We see that the accessible unit requirements are sometimes triggered for R1, and also sometimes those are B plus NYC. The majority of what we see are the B plus NYC units in R2 buildings, but it's also important to note that there are requirements for type B units in R3. Uh, again, those are for one or two family dwellings, and that requirement is triggered when there are four or more units constructed. Together. So for the R1 
uh, the requirements for the accessible units are relatively straightforward. Um, there is a table here, 1107.6.1.1, and it outlines the requirements for the total number of accessible units required. And then as subsets of those, uh, the number of units that require roll-in showers or do not require roll-in showers. Um, and again, it's just based on the total number of units provided within the building. So as an example here, um, if we have a building that has 501 total dwelling units, um, you would look in the table and you see that the, the column on the right, total number of required accessible units, requires 3% of the total. Um, it's important to understand that like egress and occupancy calculations, you cannot round these numbers down. Uh, so here, the 3% of the 501 would actually be 16 accessible units. And then breaking that down into the two subsets, uh, six of those units would require roll-in showers, and then the other 10 would not require the roll-in showers, but still must be made accessible. Uh, you would not calculate these based on the, the shower subsets and add them up. So for example, you wouldn't say that you require six with roll-in showers and then 11 uh, without rolling showers for a total of 17. Your main number is going to be the 3%, which results in this example in 16 accessible units. So here, looking at the requirements for R1, um, just keeping things in, in context, but I think just trying to look at some of the, the really relevant points of the text. Um, so here we're talking about where there are four or more dwelling or sleeping units, Occupied as a residence, remember our New York City interpretation, what that means. Every dwelling unit and sleeping unit intended to be occupied as a residence, not required to be accessible, shall be type B plus NYC, unless that number is permitted to be reduced, right? So in general, when you're talking about accessibility requirements, you're going to see the broadest requirement for accessibility up front, and then those can be further reduced based on the exceptions and allowances in the code. So we're going from accessible units, then to type B plus NYC units, and then as you see the allowance for even a further reduction to type B units. And then, as I mentioned, so there are exceptions for the type B plus NYC units that are outlined specifically here in 11.07.74, subsequently in 4.1 and 4.11, so the, the relevant portions of the text here, so these are for buildings where there is no elevator uh, that's provided. The accessible units must be located um, with the accessible route in the cellar, basement, or first floor. So again, take E plus NYC, where there's no elevator, then you have an accessible route to either the cellar, basement, or first floor. Those units on that floor must be provided with an accessible entrance and accessible route for all the units on that story. Where there are no units on that story, uh, you must provide type B units. Similarly, there are exceptions for type B units. So again, where a structure does not have an elevator, and just as a reminder, uh, the, the trigger for an elevator in building code chapter 30 is five stories. So the village we're talking about here would be four stories at most. So where there is no elevator provided, only the dwelling in units and sleeping units located on stories indicated. So again, that's your cellar, first floor, basement um, are required to be take B units. So again, you just see how the you start with the broadest requirement and then it's reduced. Now, looking at uh, one story with type B units required. So the, the units must be provided with an accessible entrance and accessible route. And then all units on that floor have to be at a minimum type B units. Again, those are the least stringent of the requirements for accessible units. Now, here in 1107.712, uh, some provisions also for type B units. And this 
actually, um, you want to keep in mind that this is based on uh, a point 50 feet from the arrival, and also that you're you're considering here the slopes of the of grade of the undisturbed site and finished grade. Um, and here, the, the kind of limit we're talking about is 10% or less. Um, and so again, um, those units have to be type B. Now, looking at an example of a new R1 building, uh, in this case, the building is 19 stories. So based on building code chapter 30, it must be provided with an elevator. There are 337 hotel rooms. So based on our table, 1107, 611, uh, there are 12 units that are required to be accessible. Now, transitioning over to R2 occupancies. So again, uh, you see here the text, every dwelling unit and sleeping unit shall be a type B plus NYC unit, unless that number may be reduced in accordance with the subsequent section. And where the number is reduced, those units must be type B. And then again, type B may be reduced. So another example, looking at a new R2 36 story building uh, containing 213 apartments. All 213 apartments must be at a minimum type B plus NYC units. Our third residential occupancy group are three buildings. Uh, again, it's important to remember that this requirement is based on four or more dwelling units being constructed together. And again, there is an allowance, uh, or I should say, a reduction allowance for the type B units. So, just to just to illustrate the point, um, in this example, we have an existing two-family R3 building, which did not trigger the accessibility requirements of the prior code for fair housing based on when it was constructed. And so, as an illustration, uh, if there is a new R3 building. Um, that's now constructed and attached at the party wall. Uh, the question we sometimes receive is whether that building must comply. And here the answer is no. And that is because the text is intended to align with fair housing, uh, which is based on the, the time of the construction. So because you are not building the four units, again, that's the, the minimum trigger for accessibility requirements, you're not building those four together, you are not subject to the now applicable accessibility requirements based on the construction. So now we'll take a look at the, the actual dwelling units now that we've discussed some of the scoping. And so the, the applicable uh, reference standards to keep in mind, there is New York City Local Law 58 of 1987. Um, that's going to be applicable uh, and cover the accessibility requirements in, say, the 68 code buildings. And that referenced the 1986 edition of ANSI A117.1. Uh, by comparison, as Maria discussed, the 2014 New York City Building Code references the 2009 edition of that standard. It's important to understand, though, for design professionals and owners that they are also subject uh, depending on the characteristics of their project, uh, funding and use, uh, they may be subject to the requirements for fair housing accessibility, um, which references the, again, the 1986 edition of the A117 or the Americans with Disabilities Act, which also references the, the 2009. Um, so it's important to understand uh, which requirements are applicable to your project and then also which are the most stringent. Um, we'll see an example later on with water closets. Uh, next, I would just like to point out that there are some great guidelines from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, um, accessible online. And they are great because they, they show the requirements for some of the components 
for example, in the toilet rooms, you know, you see the requirements for doors and doorways, turning spaces, the actual fixtures, um, operable parts, things like that. But then uh, taking it to kind of the, the next step, there actually are several examples of, um, of bathroom layouts, for example. Um, and these are helpful because they can show you kind of uh, the minimum dimensions that you're going to require in order to comply with the accessibility requirements for these rooms. Um, so you don't have to take these and, and copy them into your design, of course not, um, but it's something that you might want to keep in mind, especially at the preliminary stages of building planning, to understand that you know, you're going to need to provide at least these minimum dimensions in order to provide a compliant, accessible bathroom. Similarly, uh, there are diagrams that correspond to the kitchen requirements. Um, so the counters, work surfaces, sink, um, the appliances, storage requirements, and clearances for the room. And again, uh, you can see some, some layouts that put all these pieces together into a resulting compliant design for I should also point out that they have uh, different types. So you'll see examples for galley kitchens, U-shaped kitchens, et cetera. And again, I know that uh, Maria had a similar slide in her in her portion of the presentation, but we really just want to underscore the fact that there are a comprehensive set of requirements for accessibility. Uh, sometimes people make the mistake of thinking that accessibility requirements are really about just grab bars. And once you put grab bars in and your, your design is compliant, uh, really the, the requirements apply to a whole host of, of items in the, in the building. So here on the screen, I'm sure this looks familiar to, to most of you, uh, the type of sheet that gets copied and pasted from one project to the next, uh, often not updated just because it's not necessarily um, highest priority. Uh, so we see here is our, our lonely accessibility diagram uh, that's talking about the reach ranges. Uh, if we zoom in a bit more, you can see that it's showing compliance uh, with 54 inch maximum reach range for a side reach. Um, as we know, in the 2009 ANSI, the side reach is actually a maximum of 48 inches. And this does come up uh, sometimes um, architects or engineers who might not realize that the, the standard has changed and just hasn't updated uh, these typical detail, uh, detailed diagrams. Um, other times they are unfortunately relied upon by uh, by the construction team in order to show that they're complying. Uh, I've even seen where a manufacturer for changing tables actually still had not updated their, their reach range requirements um, on their installation drawings. So these are the types of things that you wanna pay attention to. Uh, it might be a, a tip that somebody is not actually paying, off, paying attention uh, as they should to the accessibility requirements in the design. On the screen here, uh, this is just the, the broad requirement for accessible units. And so you might see in subsequent slides a uh, reference to 11072, and that's all it is. Really, it's just that they are required to comply with the code, including Appendix P, and the provisions in Chapter 10 of the ICC A117.1. So we're going to now look at um, accessible unit. Uh, first, the, the primary entrance must be on an accessible roof. Um, those requirements that Maria already covered, uh, including walking surfaces, ramps, and the requirements for elevators and platform lifts. Next are the requirements for doors uh, intended for passage, right? So we're not talking about closet doors. Uh, those must comply with section 404. These reference numbers being in the, in the ANSI. The requirement for turning spaces, so all rooms must be provided with a turning space. Kitchens, of course, must comply with section 1003. Likewise, toilet and bathing rooms, 1003, 11.1. Uh, the requirements for in-unit laundry uh, would actually be from section 611. And then, of course, operable parts, which would apply to the entire dwelling unit. 
Uh, those can be found in section 309, uh, which Maria again already covered. So here is our unit. We're going to first look at the requirements for the kitchen. So as we see in 11.07.2.3, must comply with the requirements in ICC 8117.1, uh, 11.07.231 through 235. And I want to point out that there is an allowance actually uh, for secondary kitchens and kitchenettes. Typically, this is something that we see for bathrooms, not necessarily for kitchens. Nevertheless, it is there in the text that um, where it is a secondary kitchen, um, you have uh, the different requirements there complying with only 1004.12. So now looking at our kitchen, we can see here um, the interior elevation, with a bit of a plan segment above. And so we're going to first look at the requirement for a work surface. So the work surface requirement is for a 30 by 48 clear floor space. Um, that's familiar, again, from Maria's portion of the presentation, you're going to see these building blocks occur throughout. So again, the 30 by 48 space for a forward approach at the at the working surface. You can see that's easily accommodated in the proposed design uh, between the range and the sink. Uh, now looking at the elevation, uh, the, the countertop height is shown as three feet. And then again, you see that, that 30 inches there between the range and the sink. And as I mentioned, the, the countertop height is located at 36 inches. In 1107.231, you'll see that there are allowances um, for adjustable uh, varying heights. The countertop may be between 29 and 36 inches measured from the floor to the top of the work surface. Um, it's also important to understand that there are allowances for the base cabinets to be removed in order to provide that forward approach, right? So because this is in a the kitchen in a dwelling unit, so you must have the forward approach. You cannot uh, simply use a, a parallel approach. Um, but there is a, a requirement, though, that the floor finish be continuous underneath the base cabinet. The idea is that when an occupant moves into the space, these accessibility measures can be readily accomplished and as specified there in the text, within 10 days of the date of the request. So that's why um, you know, there's not necessarily an allowance to rip out the entire kitchen and reinstall a new one. There are only these uh, kind of narrow defined measures which are permitted to be changed upon occupancy. Next, uh, looking at the sink requirement, again, you have the 30 by 48 clear floor space requirement with the forward approach. Again, easily accomplished uh, in the proposed design. And similar to what we saw for the work surface, there is the maximum of 34 inches for the, the height of the sink. But again, the allowance 29 to 36 inches. One of the one of the uh, little wrinkles I should point out though too is that where you're planning on adjusting the height of the sink, you have to ensure that there are the proper provisions for the plumbing as well. Um, so that's going to be your, your drainage and your supply lines. Uh, moving on to the appliances. First, the refrigerator. So we have the clear floor space requirement uh, centered on the refrigerator, and there is the allowance for the forward approach and also for a parallel approach. Depending on just the, the proportions of your kitchen, you may have the option for one or the other, or you might only have uh, the, the provision for one. Next, looking at the, the range of the cooktop, the clear floor space is permitted to be a parallel approach here, of course. Um, with 
the center line on the range. Um, there is there is possibility that you could comply with the cooktop um, and also even allow for a forward approach for that. Typically, it's not something we see in New York City, but it could be done. Next, we have the, the requirement for the dishwasher. And as you see here, there are actually a number of locations uh, for the clear floor space. Uh, you can have it as a parallel approach with the, the door to the dishwasher open. You can have a forward approach to the side, or even, um, as indicated here, a parallel approach kind of offset with the, the proximity to the sink. Next, I would, I would like to touch upon the, the storage requirements. And so, as we see here in the proposed design, um, they have a, a dashed in location showing an accessible shelf that's mounted at the maximum 40 inches above the finished floor. So, you see the storage requirements in 905 of the ANSI A117.1, um, requiring there that they comply with at least one of the reach ranges. Therefore, a lot of times in New York City, you'll see this. Um, this indication that the shelf will be installed at the 48 inches, but is not necessarily um, something that's provided for. Looking back at the HPD drawings, you can see there are actually a number of ways you can comply with this requirement for the storage space. As we saw, the, the most popular perhaps is the shelf installed at the 48 inches. Uh, another approach is that you actually mount the, the cabinet box, say just the one, um, so that the bottom shelf inside inside the cabinet box would comply with that 48 inches. Um, or as you see on the side, uh, even just an, an open shelf at the bottom with the, the doors higher up on the, on the cabinet box. Next, I'd like to talk about the, uh, the clearance requirements for the room. And so you see in ANSI 1003.12.1.1, you have a requirement that there's at least 40 inches, sorry, 40 inches of clearance measured between the base cabinets, countertops, appliances, or walls. Um, so what you're looking at here is a demonstration of the, the T, uh, which is, again, it's 60 inches overall. Each leg of the T is 36 inches. But again, you're allowed to use the clearance at the below the countertop, say for the, the forward approach for the working space um, as part of your, your turning space there. So you can see how even though it's 40 inches, um, a user within the kitchen would actually be able to, to maneuver and turn. Now, if the kitchen is a U-shaped configuration, uh, the requirement is that there's actually 60 inches clear. Again, that's between opposing cabinets, countertops, appliances, or walls uh, within the, the work area. So you can see that uh, changing the configuration of the kitchen from, say, um, the galley kitchen to a U-shape, you really do have this uh, more stringent requirement, which is why we don't often see these types of kitchens in a lot of buildings. So as an example, um, we see here a proposed kitchen design with a, a peninsula having a sink. On the opposite side is the refrigerator and the range. And then on the third wall, there is a base cabinet and upper cabinet. Um, we see that according to the plan drawing, there is a space of three feet, seven inches, so 43 inches between the opposing base cabinets. And so we would be looking at whether or not this is compliant. Looking now at the turning space, um, as was shown in the, the earlier example, you are permitted to use the space um, for the forward approach at the sink uh, to, to fit the turning space in. So you might make an argument as an appl applicant that you're meeting the requirements for the individual fixtures. Um, but as you see here, the 60 inches is not possible. And unfortunately, that is the requirement. Because you have the base and upper cabinets on that third side, you're triggering the requirement that as a U-shaped kitchen, you must provide 
at least the 60 inches measured between um, between those cabinets within the work area. So this is not, again, not the compliant design. Next, we will take a look at the requirements for the toilet and bathing rooms. So where they are provided, they must comply with Appendix P. And again, there are requirements for the doors and doorways, turning space, fixtures, and optical parts. So looking first at the door into the space, again, there's that requirement for a 32 inch minimum near opening width. Uh, we see here that the door is dimensioned as 34 inches. And also I want to point out that there is a requirement for a clear floor space. Um, we'll get into it a bit further, but there are the individual requirements for clear floor spaces um, and clearances with the fixtures. And there is a prohibition on the door swinging into those minimum clearances, except except where you have this 30 by 40 inch clear floor space provided outside the swing of the door. Next, looking at the turning space, uh, we see here first trying to fit the 60 inch diameter in. Um, it looks like the lavatory might be acceptable uh, based on the, the space from the wall and also with the allowance for the, the knee clearance below provided there's not something going on with that, that drainage piping, but it looks like there might be a problem with the, with the water closet. So next we'll look at the T-space. The Again, that's 60 inches overall on each side with each leg being 36 inches. And we see here that it looks like the, the, the T turning space actually does fit in the room. Again, utilizing that knee clearance at the lavatory, but not being compromised by the location of the water closet. Next, we'll look at the, the actual requirement for the water closet. So on the screen, you can see the, the diagram from, again, those HPD drawings, uh, allowing for, um, for some encroachment from the lavatory and the requirement for the, for the water closet there being 66 inches by 48 inches. And that is for a forward approach. I should just point out that the different approaches could require Different, um, different minimum dimensions. For example, uh, if you were to use a side approach, you would have to provide 48 inches by 56 inches. So again, just understanding that uh, based on your approach, you're changing the minimum space required for what would otherwise be considered the same picture. Um, associated with the water closet, you have the requirements for the grab bars. We can see on the drawing, the applicant has dashed in those grab bars. Um, you can see some of the notation on the drawing uh, to provide 20 gauge metal plate secured to the studs for future grab bar locations. Similar to some of the other requirements within the dwelling units, there is an allowance that the, the grab bar be installed after the fact. Uh, but again, you need to, to uh, have the allowance for that by including the support in the wall during the original construction. It looks like the lengths and locations of the grab bars comply. Again, you have the requirement for the rear wall grab bar and also the side wall. There are requirements for uh, mounting heights and also for their lengths. Next, looking at the lavatory, again, we have everyone's favorite 30 by 48 inch clear floor space requirement for the forward approach. Looks like that's easily provided in the applicant's design. Now, looking at the shower requirements. Again, um, looking at the, the clear floor space. So here, the requirement is actually for a 36 by 48 clear floor space. And it's important to understand that there is a relationship that's established in the requirements um, for the location of this clear floor space based on the control wall of the shower. So looking at our proposed drawing, we see the location of the shower head on the right side there. Typically that means your controls are on that wall, which means that you cannot um, 
can't say as an applicant that you are providing a clear floor space um, in a different location. It's always in relationship to those controls. Here, because of the lavatory placement, um, the clear floor space is just not provided. The other requirement I should touch on too is the, the requirement for the seat within the transfer shower. Uh, so a transfer shower is 36 by 36, and the seat must be located opposite the control wall. Now, if we return to our text, we see that the requirement for site B plus NYC toilet and bathing rooms um, is here in 110722. And what we want to pay attention to is the fact that, similar to what was mentioned about the kitchens earlier, uh, where at least one toilet or bathing room complies with the ANSI requirements, the secondary uh, toilet or bathing room has uh, lesser requirements for accessibility. So because there are two bathrooms within this unit, we'll now look at the second one. So again, starting with the door requirement, uh, we see here it's actually um, a pocket door which is readily achievable as far as the, the, the maneuvering clearance there. Uh, you see it's really just the 48 inches on the, for a forward approach. Next, looking at the turning space, uh, we have the 16 inch diameter. The applicant has even indicated that on the drawing, so that looks great. Next, looking at the water closet, and then remember, now that we're saying that the uh, this is the primary bathroom, it must comply with the ANSI requirements. Um, so you're seeing the larger clear floor space here for the water closet than we saw in the in the previous bathroom. Now, again, looking for the uh, for the grab bars, we see that they're properly located for the side wall and the rear wall. Um, I also want to point out that the, the requirements for accessibility even dictate where the flush control is. Um, so it's on the approach side. So if you were to install a toilet with the flush control against the wall, even that would not be compliant, even though you provided grab bars and the clear floor and everything like that. Um, so again, you just really need to pay, pay attention to all the requirements that are applicable uh, to, to each specific component. The other thing I would like to address, um, as I mentioned before, uh, looking at the reference standards. So in, in the 2009 edition of the ANSI A117, there is actually a range uh, specified for the water closet. Uh, you can see that that range is 16 to 18 inches, which is useful in design and construction. Obviously, there are some tolerances. Um, you know, it, it's sometimes difficult to anticipate how finishes might change and your, your measurements might be off. Obviously, you're, if you're doing a, a wall mounting, your, your water closet carrier is installed long before the tile guy comes along. So um, the resulting dimension, that range is helpful to have, but unfortunately, um, in Appendix P, it is explicitly 18 inches measured from the side wall. So even though your reference standard allows for 16 to 18, the code specifically is 18 inches. And again, it's helpful to understand that the reason for that is that it aligns also with the uh, with the earlier edition of the ANSI, which is triggered in FHA, for example. Um, so not all standards allow for that range. Neither does the code. Next, looking at the lavatory, again, that 30 by 48 inch clearance easily accomplished in our second bathroom in this unit. Looking at the, uh, at the section drawing here, we can see that the base cabinet is marked as being removable. That allows for that forward approach. Again, the floor finish must be continuous underneath that cabinet to uh, to make it easily um, easy alteration to make in order to, to allow for accessibility here. 
Um, I, I do want to point out, though, um, there's the requirement for the mirror. As you see here, it's labeled as three feet, four inches, bottom of mirror. Specifically, the requirement is that the 40 inches be measured to the bottom of the reflecting surface. It's not something that comes up a lot. However, just to be aware of the fact that some mirrors with frames, for example, mounted at 40 inches, would not actually comply because the measurement accurately must be to the reflecting surface and not to the frame. Next, looking at our shower in the second bathroom. So we see here the floor space, the clearance is marked out. Grab bars are intended to be installed. However, again, we do not see the seat in the transfer type shower stall, which should be located opposite the control wall. Similar to our allowance where there are multiple bathrooms, multiple kitchens, um, if we look back at the text, we see that the requirement is that at least one lavatory water closet and either a bathtub or shower shall comply with section 1003.11 of ICC A117.1. So the applicant's design does not comply with the shower, but there is the possibility that the room could comply based on the compliance of the bathtub. So now looking at that bathtub, we see the requirement is that there be a 30 inch space for the length of the tub, which again, easily complying with based on the size of the room here. However, uh, there are requirements for a seat, either a removable seat or a permanent seat. The permanent seat must be at the end of the tub or the head end wall. Now, there are associated requirements based on those seats um, for the grab bars. And we can see that where the permanent seat only requires two grab bars at the control wall and the back wall, where there is going to be a non-permanent removable seat, there actually must be a third grab bar at the head and wall. And so just to go back, we can see here that the, there is no permanent seat. The head end wall, which would be on the left side of the tub on, in the plan, um, does not have a provision for a grab bar there. So therefore, this bathroom is also not compliant with the ICC A117 standards, and therefore the unit is not compliant. Here, just a quick check on those operable parts. Again, the dimensions you're concerned with are 15 inches to 48 inches measured above the finished floor. Another interior elevation. Grab bars, dispensers, controls. The elevation again, grab bars, controls. You also see the dispenser for the toilet paper properly noted as nine inches measured from the front of the water closet to the center line. I would like to point out that. The text override feature of the uh, dimensions in AutoCAD may be sometimes helpful, uh, but here clearly both four foot dimension strings are not accurate. Um, so this is a case where somebody seems to recognize that something is not compliant and then try to make the change. Um, but we do pick up on those things. Next, uh, just to discuss some of the laundry equipment. So 110728, that's where you're looking uh, in the text. Um, and again, as Maria pointed out earlier, the, the code clearly states that the machines must be front loading, um, not top loading. Again, similar to what we've seen with the others, there is an allowance in the exception that the uh, compliant appliances may be uh, replaced 
within 10 days of the occupant's request. So here, turning to the ICC requirement in 611 for the clear floor space, again, just striking out the part about top loading because the machines must be front loading. Um, so the 30 by 48 with the center line offset a maximum of 24 inches from the, from the opening. Again, operable parts, the dimensions you're most concerned with are 15 inches to 48 inches above the floor. And that's going to include uh, lint screens, the detergent compartments, all of those, all those parts. The height of the unit itself, um, the door 36 inches maximum above the floor. So now looking at uh, another type of unit, the duplex unit, which is everyone's favorite. Um, so we'll just take a quick look at how the code would apply for, for a multi-story unit. And you see here that 11.07.25 uh, specifically requires, uh, or, I'm sorry, specifies the requirements for those multi-story units. Um, and so there are a number of exceptions. Right, so again, this understanding that first there's the broad requirement for accessibility, and then you have the allowances. Uh, and so you see here that you can utilize an external elevator, so an elevator outside of the unit. You can also accomplish compliance with the stairway that complies with Section 504 in the ANSI A117. And your third is that you have an accessible route actually within the unit satisfying the requirement. So in our proposed unit, we see that there is a stair. Again, I, I'd just like to acknowledge that, of course, there is the elevator that's outside the unit. Uh, so in an elevator unit, particularly we're talking about new buildings, there's not actually going to be much of an issue uh, with satisfying the requirement for multi-story units. Nevertheless, it is something to be aware of. So we're looking at that stair. Uh, we see the, some typical details showing the graspability requirements for the handrail are met uh, as far as the dimensions, the, the space between the rail and the wall. Uh, we see the number of treads and risers indicated. And of course, the requirement here from the ANSI in section 504 is that there is a maximum riser dimension of seven inches and a minimum tread of 11 inches. Now, I would just like to make clear that while building code chapter 10 has allowances for stairs in, um, in the dwelling units and in R2 buildings, in this case, we're looking at the accessibility requirements. And because the trigger is um, to comply with the ANSI requirements, you would not be able to take advantage of that within the unit if this is your only means of complying with the accessibility requirements. Again, for a multi-story unit, in this case, there's an elevator provided, so this is not um, something of much impact. But in general, if there is not the allowance to communicate between the floors of the unit by elevator, you would really have to make sure that your stair is compliant with the ANSI requirements. One of the, the last things we'll talk about here, uh, being cognizant of time, I'm trying to wrap up, um, the, the requirement for the accessible route and how that applies to balconies or terraces. So we see here on the screen, um, there is a proposed balcony on one of the stories of our multi-story unit. And it looks like there is a substantial change in level from the interior floor surface to the floor surface of our balcony. Now, the code allows for a difference of not more than four inches. However, uh, you have to ensure that once accessibility compliance is achieved, say by the construction of a platform, um, or even if in some cases where you had enough, uh, enough floor space, if you're going to construct a ramp, you need to ensure that your 
fewer rails um, and guards are compliant with the minimum height requirements. So for example, the 42 inch height requirement might be fine for the initial occupant who does not require an accessible means to, to get to the balcony. However, when the modification is made and a platform is built at that four inches, now the guard is not compliant with the minimum height requirements. So when you're looking at balconies, you need to ensure that whatever the modification is going to be to ensure accessibility compliance, you're not then going to be non-compliant for the guard heights. So I think at this point, we've now covered the requirements for accessible units, including the entrance, accessible route, walking surfaces, ramps, elevators, lifts, doorways, turning spaces, and the requirements for kitchens, toilet and bathing rooms, laundry, and comparable parts. Um, if we have any questions from the chat, um, also I'd like to point out that any questions that we don't get to, um, you can always submit to construction codes at buildings.nyc.gov, the address there on the screen. Uh, we'll also, again, make the, the presentation available online um, and perhaps uh, put some of these questions together uh, in an FAQ. So I see a question here about an allowance for shower glass enclosures. Again, there are requirements for uh, both transfer shower stalls and roll in shower stalls. And you'll have to look at the requirements for grab bars um, and also the, the overall dimensions. Uh, so again, the, the transfer type shower stall must be 36 by 36, not 36 by 38, not 37 by 42, 36 by 36. Um, so they're, they're fairly strict requirements and glass enclosures uh, while not expressly prohibited, likely would not allow for compliance um, with, with all the requirements that would apply to the shower. I see another question here about access to balconies. Uh, hopefully, I think I touched upon that in the previous slide. So that um, there is a requirement to provide an accessible route to exterior spaces, uh, terraces, decks, patios, balconies. Um, but again, the allowance um, for compliance with the accessible route requirements based on alterations subsequent to first occupancy. I see uh, one more question here, we'll, we'll just to, to touch upon. Uh, the, explaining type A, type B, and NYC. Um, so again, the accessible units would refer to the most um, most stringent accessibility requirements, uh, meaning they comply with all the requirements in ANSI A117. Taking a, a step down is the um, type B plus NYC, and those are compliant with the code and also Appendix P. Those are some of the allowances you'll see, um, for example, in the HPD guidelines that allow for the modified clearances and encroachments, say, for the lavatory within the, the clear floor space for the water closet, those types of things. Uh, type B is the, the, least, um, the least stringent of the accessibility requirements. And I would also point out that uh, Again, depending on where you're working, whether in multiple jurisdictions, that the IBC actually has a third type um, to have A, B, and C. Their C is actually a visitable unit. Uh, that concept is not something that we have in New York City. So again, in New York City, it's fully accessible with ICC A117.1, type B plus NYC for type B. Again, the type B requirements you're going to see primarily in buildings without elevators, uh, but otherwise for a new building with an elevator, we're looking for 
at minimum take B plus NYC. So I would just like to close and thank you for your participation uh, in today's discussion. Again, I think it's an important one and I'm glad that so many people have some interest in this. Uh, any further questions uh, that you may have, please feel free to submit them to that email address. Again, construction codes at buildings.nyc.gov and we'll do our best to, to respond to those.